Well, good morning, church. Good morning, good morning. It is good to see you all this morning. May we begin by opening our hymnals together to number 568. We'll begin by worshiping through song together and opening our hymnals to number 568. And we'll sing together verses 1 and 4 of Christ for the world we sing. May we rise together as we worship God by singing Christ for the world we sing. Verses 1 through 4, number 568. be seated. Glad you're here this morning as we gather together in worship time together. I want to draw your attention to the bullets in this morning. I'm Jeremy Squire as the lead pastor and I'm in charge of this crew this morning, and uh, so on the back side of our bulletin, some things that are going on, especially are listed out in our calendar this week, and you can see all those things that are going on, especially throughout the course of the week. Next Sunday, we're going to be uh, doing a special sermon on the Lord's Prayer, so we're going to be speaking about that, and then the following Sunday is Pentecost, and so we will end the Easter season on that high holy day of the birthday of the church, especially on the inside of your bulletin, there's also a flyer of all the things that are going on. Wednesday nights have stopped till August, and we'll resume those then. And so there are lots of things to be able to take a look at, including Serve Sunday and the other things that are going on. We are going to Bersheba Springs for a mission weekend, June 2nd through the 4th. We'll mention that a little later on in the service. And VBS registration is up and online. But if you'd like to either register kids, grandkids, whatever, or volunteer, there are sheets also on the back where the pizza boxes are for kids and also on out here in the connector as well. And you can sign up to be able to volunteer in different ways to be about that as well. And there are some VBS rotation meetings happening on Wednesday night as well. So those are some of the things going on. I encourage you to look at the whole bulletin as we go through the course of the service this morning. But right now we prepare our hearts for the celebration today of our graduates. We're going to have two of our graduates here with us. Not all of them could be here with us, but Trent and Autumn are. And Autumn's having her party uh, afterwards in the uh, fellowship hall. All are invited, only some are invited, only some. 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 All are invited. Autumn says everybody's invited to her party. One to four. One to four. There it is. So she had a party at one, between one and four. And uh, so we're, we're glad to celebrate with them. And uh, so as we do all that this morning, let's center our hearts, slow our lives down, turn our internal clocks off for a moment, and just soak in God's spirit with the music of the prelude.
if you will stand and join us in our call to worship this morning. We await God's instruction for our lives. We eagerly look forward to learning more about the ways to serve God. The time is coming when our service will be needed here. Let God's love flood through our service to others. Wait, listen, the time is near. Open our hearts and spirits, O Lord, to hear your word for us today. Amen. If you guys take this time this morning to greet one another in Christian love.
Let us join together with the prayer of confession and calling printed in our bulletin this morning. Let us pray. O Lord, Easter had such an impact on our lives. We walked the byways with Jesus, ate with him, and wept at the crucifixion. Easter morn dawned brightly in our lives at the news of the resurrection, and we sang songs of great joy. Watch over us, gentle God, as we pray and work to do your will. Keep our hearts open to your loving word and ways. Amen. So today we have a great opportunity to be able to celebrate some things. And before I invite our graduates to come up, I want to see if there's any other celebrations in our congregation you want to lift up. Do we have any birthdays going on this week? Anybody having a birthday this week? No? Any anniversaries this week? Yes, Davis. 12 years. 12 years. Debbie's Debbie's been married 12 years. Dave's been along for that ride too, so that's good. Congratulations. Very good. Any other anniversaries? Very good. So an opportunity to be able to celebrate something powerful in your life that God has done. Somebody wants to share something they just want to share that's been powerful in their life this week that God hi Kathy. Oh nice. That's great. Celebration of daughter getting married May 12th in Gatlinburg. Congratulations to you, to both of you. Other, Ray. Well, Ray wants to say something too, apparently. Hey, Ray, what's up? Wow. Granddaughter got ACT back, made 34 on it. You got to top that? Our son got married also. The Barrow's son got married. On the lake, no less. Exactly. Congratulations. Very good. Yes, clap. It's good. Joys are good. Anything else? Missy's burning up, apparently. Other than that. Okay. It's always hot for me, no matter what temperature it is. I got to wear a robe and everything else. So don't, I know. I'm always sweating, so it's the way it works. Uh, graduates, come on up. Two of our four graduates that are connected to us in that way are here with us, and I appreciate them staying. Yeah, appreciate them staying around. They're here at first service, but we wanted also these two, especially, you're very connected with, and you know. And so I wanted to, to give you the opportunity to be able for you to see them too, not just see them on the screen or something like that. So I appreciate you guys for sticking around and, and being a part of that, um, especially. And then, of course, Cassie has been youth minister to these two uh, during her time here, and uh, Tiffany could not be with us. She's at a wedding in North Carolina. But we also want to have opportunity to do that um, as well. And also, um, Austin Tungett and John Lane are also graduating as well. And Austin was here at first service, and John could not be here at all because at JP2, you stay from Saturday 11 a.m. through 1 p.m. on Sunday. So that's apparently, uh, I don't know, yeah, for all the graduation stuff, so. But we wanted to kind of raise these two up especially, and then we're going to offer a time also. You may have somebody else in your life who graduated. We're going to raise them up as well in time of prayer and all that. But first of all, we wanted to, to bring some of these people up. So Autumn, show Autumn's picture first. And their and they're, uh, boards are out here to the right. I really encourage you to go and look and see about that. So Autumn, where are you going next? Plaza College in St. Augustine, Florida. Yeah. What are you going to study? But she'll not be good at it all, so it won't be any problem. She's way too introverted for that. But uh, So we celebrate. And also, the youth had a senior appreciation and an appreciation awards night for all the youth, really. But uh, at that uh, ceremony that happened several weeks ago, Autumn received the Good Samaritan Award. It is a United Methodist Award that's actually you send off for. We write something up and do all of that. It's for all of her service, not only in the church, but also outside the church. You may not know it, but Autumn has done many drives for all kinds of things. And uh, just is constantly involved, not only in youth activities, but also adult activities. And uh, so she received that award from the United Methodist Church um, as well. So you can uh, give her a hand of applause for that. Trent, my friend. Show Trent stuff. Hi, Trent. Where are you going, Trent? Salt Bay for two years and then Austin P for two years after that. Where are you going to study? Bam. Okay. <laughs> 
train has no knowledge of foreign languages whatsoever, it's going to be a horrible train wreck. Yeah, exactly. Don't teach the Spanish teacher all the, all the Spanish that you know. Play, play dumb when you get there so you can really impress that person by the time the semester's over. They're probably like, oh my gosh, I'm the greatest teacher in the world. Look how much I taught this guy. Uh, so Trent also, um, he received a special award um, actually from his school. And, and this, is, this is the award he received. It's called the Two Bill, two bill, the two bill Dollar Society is what it is. The Highway Patrol of Arizona has a special tradition. This is from his, one of his teachers at school. On the day of their graduation, the captain hands out badges, guns, and $2 bills. Their badges symbolize their duty to uphold the law. Their guns serve and protect them as they serve and protect others. And the $2 bill represents the individual as one whose uniqueness and rarity surpasses all others. The $2 bill is carried in the officer's handbill for the duration of their duty on the Arizona Highway Patrol. This teacher, Kimberly Coyle, uh, her grandfather received one of these in 1949. In 2005, he passed that bill on to her at her graduation from high school. And then on that day, she was brought into the $2 bill society. $2 bills are the most unique notes still in U.S. circulation today. Less than 1% of all notes currently produced are $2 bills. It is a special bill. And so she talks about the fact is the moment that Trent walked into her class, I knew you were special. I saw unique talents in you that surpassed all others. Man, you drove me crazy some days, but I missed having you in class most of all. Your brain works in a way that the rest of us will never be able to fully appreciate. <laughs> you see the world in a unique way that is utterly and completely you. You have this amazing ability to make people think. I am proud of the young man you have grown into. You've left a remarkable legacy at this school and in my classroom. I'm so honored to know you and have had you in class. And so like the $2 bill, you're a unique memory for me and my teaching bank. And so she gave him a $2 bill and the certificate uh, for his uniqueness. And we all know Trent is unique. That is definitely the case. And we honor that. And God has created him in a special way. And so you're welcome to give him a round of applause as well, too. Yeah, you should do that. Yeah, okay. and, oh, you have a $2 bill? Look at you. All right. You're part of the society, too. He's part of the society as well. <laughs> We, we also, um, so then also, in addition to that, Austin Tunguette, who attends First Service, Billy and Sandy's son, um, they live all the way in Springfield, so I don't know if you knew that, but they come to church every Sunday, most every Sunday, all the way from the other side of Springfield to come here and be a part of this church. Austin's going in the Marines, and so he leaves in August for that, so please be in prayers for him, and we thank him for his service and for his, his next step, and so Austin graduated, so it was neat. Maybe you've seen Austin grow up over the years, too. Mm -hmm. And then John Lane is going to be going to Belmont. I am not sure what John Lane is going to be studying at Belmont, unless somebody else knows. Um, but John is also with us, in, in this, so his pictures are out there as well, and we think about him. In addition to that, uh, people who have been related to us or have been a part of us at one time or another. Um, Logan Tanner graduated, so Tammy Tanner's daughter graduated. Andy Luttrell, who comes to this service uh, often, sits right over right where Peter, our, one of our folks, is sitting right now. His son, Michael, graduated and is going to Vanderbilt Music School. So he's really very talented. And then there was a third, yep, Zach Martin. And Zach Martin's graduating. And the, the Martins may be running out the door to get to his graduation. They're not upset or anything. They're just going to try to get to Zach's graduation. And there was a fourth person Robert I mentioned Shickling. before. Who? Robert Shickling. Yeah, there's somebody else, too. Andrew Kellerhall and Andrew Kellerhall. That's it, Andrew Kellerhall. So, and then Robert? Shickling. Robert Shickling. So Jay... Uh, Shickling and uh, so so they've all graduated as well and you probably have some graduates as well too oh Brittany May who is also our director of preschool and uh, so as as Bev would well know she graduated the degree in organizational management from Union University so she's been working hard on that she's already putting it to work and the preschool is doing wonderful and uh, is gonna be enrolled fully almost all summer which is a first and we're really excited about the work that she's doing as well and they graduated all those kids and it was 15 of them so there are 15 of them, and they graduated and threw their hats up at the end. Nobody got thrown out of school or anything, so it was really neat. And uh, we had the whole place full because they actually invited all the Little Lamb's parents, and all the kids actually did something in the service. And so we had the whole place full of Little Lamb's parents. So it was really neat to see all that, too. So I wanted you to see that as well. So I want to invite our graduates to come over here and to kneel down. I want to invite any other graduates that you feel like you've graduated from something that if you'd like to come up and come up to, you're welcome to do that as well. If there's any of those kids included who want to be have laid over and you've completed a grade and you're so excited because you got out of that grade to go on the next one, 
you can come up as well. And I want those who are attached to these folks, if they'll want to be pray, pray over them, to come up and lay your hands on them and to come up and be present. And while you're doing that, Cassie may have a few words she wants to say about these graduates as well. We're memories. So often we, we take pictures with our phones, we get on Facebook, we, we've lost the art of keeping photos in a photo album to look back on. And so I wanted to give them a photo album so they can go back from their high school years, from their prom, from mission trips, from just being teenagers. And being able to look back eight years, ten years, fifty years from now to look back at those memories. Fifty so, years. Fifty years, Autumn. <laughs> so um, I'm just I'm so proud of you too. <laughs> yeah, I know that's right. Thanks a lot. Well, she said she'd been out of high school forever. Okay, what that make you feel too? Okay, all right. Eight years. Eight years. Holy smokes! I've been out thirty. Oh Lord, let's pray. Everybody, want to lift your hands towards them? Just lift your hands, everybody. And let's join the word of prayer. And we also pray for all the graduates that couldn't be here and all the other graduates we've mentioned, especially. To the one who has called us each by name, as we hear or have heard our own names spoken aloud, and as we have received or will receive our diplomas and certificates of accomplishment, let us also hear your voice calling each one present to receive a word of purpose and direction in life. We celebrate finishing a chapter in our own history that we may continue from this day and this place to create outstanding stories that surround us every day and in all places that we may find ourselves. And so with friends and family and church community who have gathered to encourage and support these graduates, we welcome the presence of our Creator, who has anticipated this moment from the very beginning of their lives. And as your classes and grading are now complete, may you strive towards excellence in all that you do. As the speeches conclude, may your voices rise up to pronounce justice and peace in the world. As the fanfare ceases, may you sing of joy even in the dark and lonely places. As the applause quiets, may you celebrate and lift up those around you. And as you graduate today, may you achieve achievements grow and cause growth in your communities. And may we all know the overwhelming blessing of the one who created all things. And so now we bless these graduates as they go forth in this next journey in their life. May you give them purpose. May you help them to become all that you created them to be. May they go out and change the world and make a difference in your name. It's in your name we pray these important and mighty wonderful things that we give these students over to you for their future. Because you know their plans. You know where it is they're supposed to go. Now lead them there in the days to come. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, and the people of God said together, Amen. Amen. You may clap one more time for these fine folks. an appropriate anthem now. Am I doing what? What did I forget? Oh, no. We'll, we'll just move on. I'm preaching on the Lord's Prayer next week anyway, so we'll, we'll make a big thing of it again.
So as we come together for a time of offering, we bring our prayers and our presence and our financial gifts and our service and our witness. These are the things that we bring to God this morning. Through our prayers, the opportunity we have to be able to look at our prayer list, see what we're praying for, and be able to lift those people up in prayer. Uh, both Lester had sur- sur- surgery this week and Jack Donnell, and they're both doing well and uh, doing fine, so we're excited about that. But there's lots of times people have asked prayers for us through being a part of the email prayer team, and I encourage you to be a part of that. Sign up to pray confidentially for these people who have asked prayers of us during the course of the week. That's how you find out all those things that are going on in people's lives, especially when they give them to us. We also had prayers from Keith and Leslie Lovin, who attend first service and are newer to our church. Their daughter Bethany is going overseas to Barcelona, Spain for 150 days. And so they asked for prayers for her as she um, continues to go through that moment in time of her life, um, especially. So there's lots of opportunity to be able to be in prayer. A chance for us to be in service, to be present here in worship and to say, you know what, I've chosen to worship God today and to be a part of that. That's an important choice we make each and every week. And as you fill out the pad and be able to take a chance to be able to say, you know, I was here to worship God today, we look at these pads, and when folks are missing from us and we don't know what's going on with them, we, we like to check in and just be able to see what's going on. Sometimes we know why folks aren't here, sometimes we don't. But it's really easy to lose people, and we don't want everyone to lose people. because Everybody needs to have a place at the table. So fill it out, and uh, we encourage you to pass it down your row. If you're a guest with us today, we would encourage you to fill it out as well. We promise you a no hassle, no haggle guarantee. We're not going to track you down or anything. We just want to welcome you, make you feel in a place maybe you can belong, and come be a part of what we're doing here at Good Shepherd. Our financial gifts allow us to do ministry in this community and around the world. We're about to hit the summer. You're about to plan your vacations. You're about to be gone and leave and go in and out and that sort of thing. It's called the summer slump in the church. We need you to be thinking about the church and your planning and your packing lists. Because if you give every week and you're not here, the tendency is you're off on the beaches somewhere and you're not thinking about what the church and what you give to the church usually. And so you just forget. And then you try to spend the rest of the summer trying to catch up because you didn't really make that money got spent on you know, all the food you ate and the room you stayed in everything else. We really need you to avoid what happened to us last summer to really consider how to put the church first during the course of that. That means you know, it really be smart to go to online giving. If you go to push pay and you go ahead and set that up and begin to do that, we're going to have starting this summer the little cards you can put in the plates and as part of your giving. Because some of you will be saying, well, I don't have a check to write or I don't have the cash to put in. It's a little card that simply says, this is my offering to God today that I place in it. Because you've already done that online. But the act of giving is still important. I really want you to consider this summer helping us not not get to where we got to last summer, which we were dreadfully low by the end of summer. Anybody on finance can tell you that. I'm just being honest with you. So if you're that kind of weekly giver and you only give when you're here, please, please, please consider doing something electronically to alleviate that pressure off of you and off of us as well. And it's really easy to do with push pay. It's simple, 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 simple to do. You pay your mortgage, your electricity bill, the other things online, there's no difference in doing that and, and giving the church the gifts that you've got to give. Um, there's no difference. And you wouldn't think about not paying your rent while you're gone or your mortgage because you wouldn't have a house when you got back. Well, it's the same. I hope that you raise giving financially in the church to that same level that it's as important as taking care of the basic necessities of life, especially. And to serve. We're going to Bershaw in a couple of weeks, and uh, I'll happen to be there on Friday and Saturday afternoon. I was teaching licensing school to local pastors receiving their license for ministry, and Susan and I always take this time for a 24-hour Sabbath. That's all it really is. But to sit with the door open, the screen door open, let the breeze come through, and just kind of sit back and work on a sermon, that sort of thing. And, uh, but when I went up there, if you don't know it, those front rails all right there were redone several years ago before I got here by Good Shepherd. They are the lasting legacy of Good Shepherd at Beersheba. I think I even saw Brent in one of the pictures because they were flashing pictures up there. But I went up there to look at that, and so continue, there, there's some other ones there. So one of the other ones, um, hello. So those are the rails from the inside. They need to be repainted. They're, a little, they're looking a little worn now, need a little repainting, but they look in good shape structurally so they're good to go but 
I went down to Vesper Point, which is one of the most beautiful places that you can go to at Bersheba Springs if you haven't been there, or haven't been there lately. And this is what the benches look like. We are going to replace those benches. That's one of the things the group is doing. Those are very hard to sit on, let alone lay on when you have splinters in your back. And that's what I tried to do is lay on one of them. It didn't work too well. So we're going up there to do that. The youth are leading this trip, and the adults are going to support. So all together, the people are coming together for missions. It's $35. It only covers food. That's all, it's all, the rooms are free. So it's just for food. So if you feel led to do that, there's a clipboard in the very back. There's a clipboard over here on the table as well. But we want to go ahead and bring it back up to what it's looked like in the previous past. And uh, Good Shepherd also has, in the past, painted the playground. And before I got here, I remember being at, at, at uh, Bersheba one time saying, wow, what a beautiful playground. It's so colorful. And for years, it was dull and lackluster. And I didn't even know who Good Shepherd even was then, but I was so thankful that somebody did that. Well, that's Good Shepherd. The women did that? Well, there you go. The women did that. So, so all those pieces, don't tell me the, don't tell me the whole story. I, can't, I don't have time for the whole story. Oh, good. Yeah, okay. All the, all the green benches are the ones you guys painted? Oh, wow. Okay, awesome. Look at that. So there you go. Good Shepherd's always been a part of it. So we want you to come out and be a part of it again. $35 all you need. Let Davis know. Sign up on one of the clipboards, and we go from there. And then witness. That's what we're talking about today during the course of, of the sermon about spreading the good news. So we'll discuss that when we do the sermon. Prayers, presence, financial gifts, service, and witness. Let our ushers come forward this morning to receive.
gracious God, as we come into this place, we are so thankful. Thankful for gifts of celebration. Thank you, thankful for new journeys. Thankful for the new life you've given to each one of us. Lord, help us to connect with you in this place, to know you and your presence in our lives. Help us to grow, to grow in what we know of you, how we act, what we say, what we do. Help us to serve, to serve faithfully to your people in this community and around your world and everywhere in between. And help us to go, to go and spread the good news of the gospel, to share the story that you have given to us. And so through all of these things that we bring, our prayers and our presence and our financial gifts and our service and our witness, let us serve you and the mission you have given us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. And the people of God said together, amen. You may be seated. Invite kids to head to the back for kids' worship. Head on back. While they're heading back, Quick update on Susan, sent an email last night about that, but she was here this morning, and she's doing better, and now we just need to take some of the treatment options, which the first one of those is an epidural steroid block, and see if that works, and how long it works, and then go from there, and uh, just see what goes. So please keep her in your prayers especially, but we thank you for your, your prayers and continued prayers, and uh, that's where we're at. Let's pray. Gracious God, may your spirit alight on us and be present around us and through us and among us this morning as we gather in this place. We invoke your presence and we ask that you would create in us a sense of what you're calling us to be on this most vital of missions, spreading the good news. Challenge us, convict us, guide us, show us your way, show us how to be your people and to be your witnesses in this world. And now speak through the words that I have to say. May they be acceptable and pleasing to you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. And the people of God said together, amen. So during Lent, we talked about what on earth am I here for? Finding God's purposes for your life. How many of you completed the book, Purpose Driven Life? How many of you actually got through the whole book? Very good. Clap for yourselves. That's very good. It's very good. If you didn't get there, it wasn't a study, and it wasn't a Lenten thing. If you want your life to change and to be different, it will require you to do things differently. If you do things the same way and expect some difference in your life, you know what that's called. Insanity. It's not going to work. But if you want to be different, then I would encourage you, whether you got to chapter 2 in that book, or any other book for that matter, about your spiritual life, to just keep going. Go to chapter 3. Maybe you might get chapter 10 by the end of the year. Who knows? That's okay. And some of you said, I've read it. I need to go back and read it again. Go back and read it again. Go back and read it slower. Go back and really study the things you want to study and that sort of thing. But don't give up. The only way that we will change as people and as Christians is by doing things differently. It's the only way. If you're watching the predators and you're all about them, the predators are not winning because they don't change and don't do things differently and don't practice and don't get themselves better. We expect our sports teams, we expect our graduates to grow and to become and to do so many things, but so often we don't expect ourselves to grow. Well, that's for somebody else. I don't have to grow. I'm set in my ways. I'm already done. Well, if you're already done, then God's pretty much going to be done with you because God expects us to grow. It's expectation. Jesus was always growing, always teaching, always learning. The disciples were always doing the same thing. So it's important. And this book was really important because it's about finding God's purpose in your life. And if you want to know that, it started off with these things. It said, one, you're going to learn to love and know God, which we call worship. 
So two, you're going to learn to love other people in God's family, which we call fellowship. Three, you're going to grow in character to become more like Jesus Christ. That's called discipleship. And then right before Easter, we looked at how you're going to serve God with all your gifts and your abilities. And the Bible calls that ministry. And once you know how to do all four of these things, then you come to the fifth purpose, which we now get to after what to do with an empty tomb. It makes the most sense. Now, because I got sick, we had to push everything back, which is why we didn't get to it. But it actually makes more sense to have this purpose end up this whole sermon series. Because what do you do with an empty tomb is especially this. God wants you to pass on what you know to other people. Because the fifth purpose is you were made for a mission. Say that with me. You were made for a mission. Now wake up and say it again. You were made for a mission. You were made for a mission. You and I were made for a mission. John 17, 18 says in the words of Jesus, In the same way that you gave me a mission in the world, I give them a mission in the world. Now notice what it says In the world. In the world. There's a difference between a mission and a ministry. A ministry is to believers. A mission is to those who don't believe. You need a ministry in the church, but you need a mission in the world. John 20, 21, Jesus said, As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And what are we sent to do? What is our mission? Well, Paul tells us in Acts 20, 24, he says this in this version that I'm reading here, different from up there. It says, the most important thing that I complete is that I complete my mission. That the work the Lord Jesus gave me, which is this, to tell the people the good news about God's grace. That's your mission. My fifth purpose in life is to share the good news, the gospel. Probably the hardest one. If we actually had a tally and a score sheet here about all, how how many people we've talked to about our faith in the last week, the last month, the last year, and it was actually something visible everybody could see, I would expect that most of us would score pretty low on that particular test. Amen? Amen? I love this topic because it's like everybody's like, I don't want to talk about this at all. In both services, everybody's kind of like, oh, I don't want to discuss this. You know why? Because we don't do it. We know it's important. We know we're supposed to do it. If you read your Bible and read any other words and accept those words, you have to accept these words in the same way because this is the whole deal. It was not for a bunch of disciples with long beards and long flowing robes to go around and change the world and then somehow it doesn't come down to us the same way. We are to share the good news, the gospel. You see, once I know that God made me to love me and my life is not an accident and I know that God has a purpose for my life, once I know that, God expects me to pass that along. You see, somebody told you about Jesus in your life. Whether you were small, large, or somewhere in between. Somebody told you about Jesus. Whether it was the church or an individual. Somebody told you about Jesus. And yet somehow we think that it's not our obligation, our responsibility to tell somebody else about Jesus. Do you think the folks that came before you who told you about Jesus, what if they hadn't done that? And yet somehow it just stops with us because that's somebody else's job? You see, it's all of our jobs. Whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, being an introvert, I'm an introvert. It does not get you off the hook for sharing the gospel, the good news. You're not going to get to heaven and go, Jesus, say, you know what? You created me as an introvert. I just can't do that. I mean, I'm just not into that kind of stuff, talking to people. Jesus is going to say, you know, 
I created you for this mission. You need to find some way to do it then as an introvert that works best for you. And there are plenty of ways to do that. You see, you've got to tell other people about it. And there's a word for this, and it's a word that makes us cringe. It's the word evangelism. Nobody likes the word evangelism. It's a scary word. It makes us feel like this. Because we are scared of it, and we misunderstand the word. We are scared of evangelism. Evangelist, evangelize. No, no. When I say evangelism, the first thing you think of probably is an evangelist with giant white hair asking you for money on your TV screen. That's not what it means. Evangelism is just the Greek word for good news. Good news. You like sharing good news. The graduates celebrating are celebrating good news. They've graduated. We like hearing that. We like seeing good news. The joys we share in services, that's good news. Getting married, good news. It's just good news. We wouldn't think about not sharing other good news. We, we all want to get our piece of good news in. But yet somehow this good news, we act like it's bad news. Like it's not something I should be talking about or should be embarrassed about. The thing about good news, interesting is, is that some folks don't, even, don't care about your good news in the first place. They don't care. You know. They don't care Debbie and Davis married 12 years. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because it's your good news, not theirs. You see, in, in telling the good news, maybe you'll tell somebody the good news and they won't like what you have to say. That's okay too. Toughen up. Share it anyways. You're not responsible for what somebody does with the good news, but you are responsible for sharing it. You see, you're responsible for sharing that good news. But all it means is good news. Acts 1.8, Jesus is speaking again before he leaves. And he says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Witnesses. Well, what's a witness? You watch lots of crime shows probably. You've seen lots of witnesses on TV. Maybe you've been a witness somewhere yourself. You know, you know what a witness is. Jesus did not say you have to be the defense attorney. He did not say you have to defend God. Your job is not to defend God to somebody. Well, I think God's all this, this, and this. Your job is not to defend God. God can defend God's self. Doesn't need you. So you don't have to have all the right words to be able to defend God and be able to prove logically an argument that somehow you're going to win them over because you've got to defend God. He also did not say you're my prosecuting attorney. So your job is not to force people to accept Jesus either. You don't have to stay there and on their doorstep until they give in to Christ and finally, you know, after eight hours, will finally, you know, just, just finally give their life over. That's not your job either. And someone says, yeah, I want to hear a word about that. I'm sick and tired of that. Don't get in these Facebook things where you have these back and forth conversations about believing in God and all that. It's the worst place in the world to do stuff like that. If they don't want to believe, that's okay. They're not forced to but you still have a responsibility of sharing with them. So what he said was, I want you to be my witness. I want you to be my witness. And what does a witness do? All they say is, what did I see? This is what happened to me. That's it. To be a witness just means it's sharing what God has done in your life with others. It's no fancy language, it's not right or wrong. If God has changed your life in some way, and I hope you're sitting here and God has changed your life, but if not, I would certainly search for that. But if God has changed your life, then it is our obligation to share that. It's the way it works. It's our obligation to share that change in our life. You know, there's the most expert person in the room here. You are. You're the most expert person in the room on your life. No one else can tell your story like you tell your story. No one else has the same story that you do. No one else's story is better than someone else's story or worse. You're the expert on your life. No pastor, no priest. God just says, I just want you to go out and tell people 
This is what I have done in your life. When do you ever tell people about what God has done in your life? About how excited you are to be present in the life of God. Yeah, anybody can do that. Well, what, what are we supposed to do it at, though? Where are we supposed to do it? He says, in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and in the ends of the earth. When Jesus says these words to his followers, they are in Jerusalem. They are not anywhere else but Jerusalem. And so Jerusalem, he's saying, is the people closest to me. The people closest to me. He's saying, I want you guys to start in your hometown. Start with the people who are closest to you, your family, your friends, all those people around you, people in your very home. Then he says, I want you to go to Judea and Samaria. Judea and Samaria are the people that are near, but they're different from me. Like the folks of Sumner County. They're near, but they're different. Because the Samaritans were different culturally and racially. He says, I want you to go out to be with people who live near you, but who are outside your normal walk of life. People you don't run into every day. And then he says, just in case I left anybody out, I want you to go to the ends of the earth. And so the ends of the earth equal everybody else. So if we're not clear that somebody's not included or is included, this clears it up pretty well. Ends of the earth, everybody else. Because purpose, too, is that God is building a family. And God wants members of the family to be from every part of the world and from every nation. You see, Jesus started this mission when he came to earth. But he has chosen you and me to complete it. And that's pretty amazing. We're it. We are the plan. If you went up to Jesus and you said, Jesus, you know, I'm not really good at this. I'm not doing a really great job. I haven't invited somebody to know Christ in years and barely talk about my faith. And like, what's your other plan? Jesus says this, there is no other plan. I put you in charge of this. You are in charge. I've given you the tools. I've given my very life for you. You're the one who is in charge of seeing the plan through. So being on a mission for God is not only our greatest privilege, we actually have the chance to be history makers, to change lives, to make a difference. So how do I fulfill my fifth purpose for mission? There are three ways. First, I must share with those in my world. I must share with those in my world. This is my Jerusalem. It's our Jerusalem. Those who are around me, You see, there was a man who came to Jesus, and Jesus healed him, and then he wanted to travel with him. And Jesus said, go back home and tell people how much God has done for you. So the man went all over town telling Jesus how much Jesus had done for him. You see, Jesus Christ says the same thing to you the moment you become a believer. He says, don't go around following me all the time, go back home. Go back home. Go back and tell other people about how I have been involved in your life and what I've done for you. I think sometimes we think it's another box to check off our list. I go to church. Well, number one, church is not Jesus. That's real different. You can go to church your whole life and not be anything about Jesus. But it's being baptized, growing up in the church, all those pieces, it didn't just stop. It isn't like a box check off. I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I'm, I'm good. I got here. I'm sitting good. I don't really care about anybody else. That's not how you really are. So how do we show that? How, how are we living that out? He says, I want you to go back home. Tell your friends, your relatives, your neighbors, tell your coworkers, tell everyone around you. That's where the mission starts. Not off in some far off country. God says, I want you to start in your own backyard. I want you to know your neighbors. How many of you know your neighbors four houses down? How many of you know your neighbors not even one house down? 
Maybe people know your whole neighborhood. He wants you to start in your own backyard. And we're around people all the time. And yet we don't tell them about the good news. Why is that? Because for one reason we've bought into a myth. And the myth is this. People don't want to hear about spiritual issues. They don't want to know about God. But that is not true. Over the last three years, every survey and poll has shown that the interest in spiritual issues in people's lives have gotten higher, especially at post 9-11 where everything changed for everyone. But that we assume they don't want to know about it or they would. Many are just waiting for an invitation. My guess is some of those people work, live with, or live near you. They're your friends. They're your neighbors. They're your relatives. Opportunities for you to share the good news are all around you every day. But you have to be ready for them. Whenever they present themselves and take advantage of them. I know an eye doctor who put this on an eye chart in his office and it says, when he says, read the first line, it says this, God loves you and has a plan for your life. Every single person in the eye doctor has to read that because it's the first line on the eye chart. Well, you can get mad all you want about it, but guess what? You can quit going to the doctor, but he's still going to say the same message. You got to read it. It's the top line. And maybe a conversation starts. You have to be persistent. The love cards we've been talking about and are redoing this past week and be ready to go hopefully by next Sunday. You matter and you are loved. Is there any greater message than that to give to somebody you come across in your life? You know, if it's a simple card, I mean, think about, you know, things that you can do. Think about this. People live, move into your neighborhood and they're brand new. Do you go over and meet them? Or do you watch them behind the curtain to see what kind of stuff they're bringing into their house and how much work is going on over there? Have you ever gone down to them and actually said, hey, can I help you move a few things in? Have you ever brought some cold drinks over? When you see those graduation signs, people's yards, have you ever stopped by that house and said, you know, hey, I saw that your son or daughter's graduating. I want to let you know I'm praying for them right now. They can think you're a nut job all you want. That's fine. It doesn't matter what people think about you. You've got to get over that. Because sharing the gospel is going to come with that kind of an edge. Sharing the gospel is going to be uncomfortable. Sharing the gospel is somebody's not going to like you when you get done, probably. You may get nine people that like you, one person doesn't. Or the verse. Do you think Jesus went through his life just for folks to like him? Because unless you look, don't read the scripture the same way I do, there are plenty of folks didn't like Jesus and what he did. And he still went on and did it anyways. Figure out, you know, new babies in your neighborhood. Do you ever stop by? Oh, it's so awesome. You guys are parents. Look, I don't care if we mention the church. Don't mention the church at all. Just go and build relationships with them. Get to know them. Let them know you as a person, not as a church member. Don't try to get them to sign the dotted line to come to service. Sign the dotted line to be involved in their life. That's how it works nowadays. Jesus is relational. And that's how it works. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Be ready at all times to answer anyone who asks you to explain the hope you have, they ha the hope you have in you. They have in you. That you have. Can you do that? Can you explain to someone if they asked you right now to explain to them why you believe in Christ and why you serve? This is a scripture in the Bible. Can't pick and choose the ones where everybody loves everybody and all that kind of stuff without having the accountability, which is you're supposed to be able to explain your faith to someone when they talk to you. You want to know how much God cares about your neighbors? Look at the cross. Jesus with his hands outstretched and nailed to the cross said, I love your neighbors, I love your co-workers, I love your relatives, I love your friends this much. And we care about people that much because God said to us, I love them this much. Not this much, not myself, this. Inclusive, everybody included. Number two, I must dare to reach beyond my world. This is Judea and Samaria. 
I had to break out of my comfort zone and dare to reach beyond my world people who are different languages and economic and educational backgrounds. 1 Corinthians 9.22 says, Whatever a person is like, I try to find common ground with him so that he will let me tell him about Christ and let Christ save him. In other words, Christians are supposed to build up bridges, not walls. To find the ways that we connect, not the ways that we differ. Somebody's all tattooed up and you don't like tattoos, I don't care. Not your decision. You don't have to accept what they do in order to be able to figure out whether you're going to love them or not. You love them first for and foremost, and you find the things you might have in common. My friend Kathy has tattoos. We have lots of things in common. We don't have to be the same. What? They start conversations. First tattoo she points out is love forgives and it's a purple heart pointing to God. In other words, you know, we have to build these bridges, not walls. God expects us to make the first move to people who are not like us. We are not to wait till they come in the door and then welcome them hospitably, because we do that great. We are to be outside in the community, meeting them where they're at, not waiting for them to come somehow to where we are. Amen? Jesus says, don't sit back and wait for people to come to you. I want you to go. Galatians 6.2 says, stoop down. Reach out to those who are oppressed. Share their burden and so complete Christ's law. What is Christ's law? It is love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. And he says, how do you do that? You stoop down. I love the wording. You stoop down it means you have to have effort. You have to stoop down. It takes effort. Some of us more than others. You have to get down to where people are at, not look from above. You don't have to leave Hendersonville or Sumner County to do this. You can go just miles from here and you're in whole different cultures, economic statuses, even languages. God says reach out to the people around you and God says our actions should prove our love. Not what we say about our actions. James 1.27 says, Real religion, the kind that passes muster before God the Father is this. Reach out to the homeless and loveless in their plight. You see, Jesus was always caring about the underdog. He's always hanging out with the outcasts of society, the people that everybody wanted to ignore, the poor, the imprisoned, the rejected, the powerless, those who were hurting. He cared about the aged and the orphans and the mentally ill, hung out with folks who had leprosy. Jesus would be the places in our world where people are hurting the most, not in our church pews. He would be out there somewhere where people are hurting and broken, and that's where we would find him. Because the Bible says that one day that God is going to judge the quality of our love. Do you say, I'm a loving person? Jesus is going to say, prove it. Show me. Are you willing as a loving person to go out of your way and reach beyond your own world? Or is it just talk? The Bible says this very famous verse, which we all know from Matthew 25. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. And they said, Lord, when did we do this? And Jesus said, as you've done it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you have done it to me. One day Fulton Sheen, the famous Catholic bishop, was visiting a leprosy colony in Africa. And he was standing by all these bodies that were lying around. And he walked up to one man whose large open wounds on his legs were oozing. And he leaned over to talk to him and the cross that he was wearing fell off and into the oozing wounds of the man. And the bishop said this, for a moment I was aghast. I was revolted by the thought of getting that cross back. And then all of a sudden I was filled with compassion and the love of Jesus Christ. And he said, I reached up into the sore and I took up the cross. There isn't a better example of what it means to be a Christian than that. Reaching into the shores of life and taking up the cross. The whole business of Christianity is healing broken, messed up lives. If you want folks put together, go down the street somewhere. Because people here are messed up. We are broken, every one of us. Whether you want to admit it or not, there is something that is broken about us or we wouldn't be in need of Jesus Christ in the first place. Amen? And so we bring other broken people to be with us in life.
and it's messy. That's what Jesus did. He said, you'll know them by their actions, not by, by their actions, by their fruit. To share my mission around the world, the one that God has given me, I have to start at home. I must share with my own world, and then I must dare to reach beyond my world. But even that's not enough, because the last thing, I must care about the whole world. This is our ends of the earth. Because God cares about the whole world and died for the whole world. Does John 3.16 says God died for just you in America. God died for just this part of the country. God died for just those in Sumner County. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. I mean, you say, I can't change the whole world. You can't. But you can change one person's life in the world. Mark 16, 15 says, Jesus said to his followers, go everywhere in the world and tell the good news to everyone. But notice what he says to his followers. He didn't say to the missionaries that we send. He didn't say to pastors. He said his followers. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that is a command. It is a commission to you. And God expects you to care about the whole world. Jesus said, follow me and I'll teach you how to fish for people. If you're not fishing, you're not following, Jesus says. And this is the big question that really just struck me when I was working through this is, is anybody going to be in heaven because of you? Is anybody going to be in heaven because of your words? Because you reached out to him through your faith. When you get there, is somebody going to say to you, thank you for speaking to me. You lived next door to me for five years. You worked for me with me for three years. You had a class with me in school. And you told me about Jesus. Thank you. So God has a mission for you. And God wants you to share that good news with others. You have four possible responses. You can say like Moses, who me? You can say like Jonah, not me. You can say like Habakkuk, why me? Or you can say like Isaiah, send me. And Rick said that the most dangerous prayer that you can pray is this. God, use me. Do you have the courage to say that? I dare you to say today, God, use me any way you want me. Any way you want to use me, any place, any time. You know the song, I'm going to live so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. And right before Jesus left for heaven, what we call the ascension, and after appearing to the disciples outside the empty tomb over the weeks, these are the last words that I close with that Jesus said. He says in Matthew 28 to them and to us, Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. You and I were made for a mission. We were made to be Matthew 25 people. That's the great commandment, to love our neighbor. But if that's all we do, then we miss it. Because anybody can feed people. Anybody can build houses. Anybody can make somebody's life better in this world and not believe in Jesus Christ whatsoever. We must also be Matthew 28 people because that's the Great Commission. And it is why we are Matthew 25 people. So we must never forget that the Great Commission is our reason but why we serve the Great Commandment in the first place. We love Jesus, so we serve. You and I were made for a mission. Let us pray. Father, more than anything else, I want to fulfill the purposes I was created for. These are the words we say to you today. Today I accept my mission on earth. I want you to use me anytime, any way, any place. I want to bring others to you. I want to serve your purpose in my time and help our church to do the same. Help me to reach one more for Jesus. I pray in your name. Amen. So the invitation is about this good news. It's not scary to share who you are. You don't have to know anything to do it. 
just share how God has touched your life and transformed your heart. Don't let your coworker sit across there crying and you're thinking, I shouldn't even say anything to them because that's their own business. It's not their own business. We are called to be our brother and sister's keeper. That means we meddle in others' lives for the good and the glory of God. What's the worst that can happen? They tell you to shut up. You know what? That's all right. I get told to shut up all the time. You probably do too for a lot less important things. So you might as well do something important and get told to shut up than to, than to do something else. I just want to encourage you that that is part of who we are. Somebody passed Jesus on to us. We have got to pass Jesus on to somebody else. It is our fifth purpose. You were made for a mission. And I invite you to consider that this morning. May we respond um, to Jesus' invitation to us to share the gospel by singing number 593. We'll sing verses 1 and 2 of Here I Am, Lord, and we'll sing verse 3 at the conclusion of the benediction. Would you rise as we worship God together and sing Here I Am, Lord? And I invite you, you want to come forward to say, you know, the Lord, here I am, Lord, send me. Tell me what you want me to do. Tell me how to do this. Pray for somebody. The altar rail is open for everybody in this one particular thing. Maybe you need it in some way. Just reach out. Let God speak to you this morning. I who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? That is Jesus asking us directly to our face, eye to eye. Who's going to bear my light to them? Who's going to share and be able to give the witness to what Christ has done? Not just Wayne and Linda giving out 500 cards every time they do something. It's not their job to carry the weight of bearing the light of Christ to all those around. All of us have a story. A story to share and a story to use. I would challenge you this week to find somebody who intersects with your life and to share some bit of the Christ story in you with them. May we go forth and do that this week. Amen. May we sing verse number three. Thank you.
go and be the light in the body of Christ. Amen and amen.